and the church said amen. Certainly we thank God for his goodness and we honor the Lord today to our presiding bishop in his absence, members of the general board that are present, Bishop Ted Thomas, resident bishop to officers of our great church, Bishop Lyles, general secretary, all of the elected officers that are present, and certainly we thank God for our wonderful chairman of the General Council of Pastors and Elders, Superintendent Michael Eady. Let's praise God for him. <clears throat> well, I've got an assignment, and I've got an allotted time to do this assignment in, and so I shall be obedient to that task. There was a young man who got out of seminary and got up in his first sermon out of seminary, and he wanted to wax eloquent, and he began by posing a question, what should a preacher preach about? And he posed that question about three times, what should a preacher preach about? And one of the mothers stood up on the front row and said, about 15 minutes. <laughs> Acts chapter 3 the first nine verses reads as follows. Now Peter and John went up together in the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alm. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. I just want to pose one question to you this afternoon. While you're eating in between bites, just look at somebody and ask them, is the church worth looking at? Sisters and brothers, a poet once said, the church is never a place, but always a people. Never a fold, but always a flock. Never a sacred building, but always a believing assembly. The church is you who pray, not where you pray. A structure of brick and marble can no more be the church than the clothing you wear could be who you are. In short, Jesus didn't die for a building. He died for you and he died for me. He died for people. And the people who accept his forgiveness on his terms make up the church. May I submit to you that there are no unimportant people to God. When Jesus chose his 12 disciples, there wasn't one of them that would impress any of us. Most of them were uneducated workmen. Several were rough fishermen who spent their times out on the open water catching fish and uh, repairing their nets and sitting in boats. One of Jesus' disciples was even a tax collector. And just like today, everybody hated tax collectors. Matter of fact, there's some folks sitting in this room that would leave if I told you the IRS was outside the door. These are not the people that Jesus chose that I would have chosen if I wanted to create my church. These were not impressive people, but then again, God usually isn't all that impressed by impressive people. May I submit to you that God is not moved by your pedigree, by your diploma, or by your status in society. And here we have two of Jesus' otherwise unimpressive disciples. They are the classic odd couple, Peter and John. You know their characters. They're like Felix and Oscar. They were different, but neither was deficient. They were like Malcolm and Martin, same goals, but different personalities. One was hot-headed. If you push Peter, he would fight and maybe even curse. You do know that Peter carried a sword and one day even cut a man's ear off. 
But by contrast, if you push John, John would cry. On the breast of Jesus, he wept. Peter was one that believed in high church. He would like the Hammond B3 and the hand clap and the foot stomp, but John was more ethereal and sensitive and pensive. Peter had grit in his personality, and John had grace. When Jesus needed to leave the keys to the kingdom, he gave them to Peter because to handle the drama of you guys, uh, he needed somebody that had some grit. But when he wanted to leave the keys to his mama's house, he left them to John and said, Son, behold thy mother. They were different. They were not connected by blood because Peter had a brother whose name was Andrew and John had a brother whose name was James. But they weren't with their biological brothers now. They were called together by a different kind of glue. And I know blood is thicker than water, but the spirit is thicker than blood. And there are some people that you have no biological or anatomical connection with who are closer to you than those who came out of the same womb. For like Jeremiah said, everybody that's your kin is not your kind. And so here they are together in the text. They're going to the temple at the hour of prayer and they encounter a man who is rather nondescript. We don't have his name, but he's sitting there observing them. He's religiously profiling them as they go into the church. And the text says that the man was lame from his mother's womb. That his condition, he had a congenital defect from the time he was born, he was enfeebled. The word lame translates into impotent, incapable of standing. He was impotent, but yet important to God. And it's important to note that we see some brothers on the corner and some sisters on the corner, and we see some brothers with their pants hanging around their ankles and some sisters with their skirts going up to Canada. And sometimes we start to judge them by saying they are so inappropriate, but it's important to understand that they have been impotent from their mother's womb. From the time they were born, nobody gave them the kind of training and the kind of culture that some of us received. When you look at the statistics, they say that 70% of those incarcerated are African-American males, but what we don't deal with is the fact that 98% of the 70% never had a father to take them to Sunday school. 99% never had a mother to kneel down next to their bed and teach them the Lord's Prayer or the 23rd Psalm. You see, there's a statistic behind the statistic that says from the mother's womb, they were enfeebled. So lame is his condition, but let's look at his position. He's sitting there at the curb, at the gate, outside the church, sitting there with no real hope of receiving more than he had gotten day after day. And if you turn to Acts 4, you'll find out that he wasn't even 40 years old. They had taken him there continually. And how many times have we seen those on the corner who have been lost and they have no more gumption to get up and do more than what they're doing? And here we are trying to encourage those on the corner and at the curb and that are laying and wallowing in the shadows of life to get up. But their attitude is, I've been down for so long that staying down is easy and getting up doesn't even cross my mind. How important it is for us to look at the position they're in. They're down. There's no driving them to move beyond where they are. It was Benjamin Mays that said, it's not failure, but low aim, that's sin. And so often folks suffer from the psychic disfigurement where they no longer see themselves as they really are. Well, let me break it down for you like this. Do you remember the Lion King? I know we're in Virginia and not in Florida, but you remember the Lion King. You remember Mufasa, the deceased head of the pride? He looks down and he sees his son Simba. And he sees Simba hanging out with a meerkat. He sees Simba walking around with a warthog. He sees Simba there eating bugs and eating plants. And he appears to him in a vision and he says, Simba, you are more than what you have become. And our challenge now is to let folk who are living beneath God's privilege 
privilege know that they are more than what they have become. We need to let young men know that they are more than a statistic. They are more than a pimp or a player. We need to let young ladies know that they are more than a notch in somebody's belt, more than somebody's baby mama, more than a dime piece or a hoochie or a chicken head. We need to tell them that they are more than what they have become. So the lame man makes a request, give me some gold, give me some silver. Peter and John respond, silver and gold we don't have. Here they come and they encounter a man nondescript, a persona non grata, and they look at him and they say, we can't help you with your request, but what we have, we will give it to you. They look at the man and they say, check us out. And I wish today, Church of God in Christ, that we would take a moment to begin to look at ourselves and see if we are worth looking at. For the Bible tells us that the focal point of God's desire for the church was that we love one another. Was that we be devoted to one another, that we honor one another, that we live in harmony with one another, that we not judge one another, that we accept one another, that we teach one another, that we serve one another, that we be compassionate and kind to one another, that we offer hospitality to one another. And when we take inventory of what we do, are we meeting the standards that are mandated by Scripture? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have conferences, but do we love one another? We have revivals, but do we live in harmony with one another? We have musicals, but do we show compassion and encourage one another? We have fish fries and dinners and banquets, but do we honor one another and accept one another and serve one another? Just look at somebody and say, are we worth looking at? Do we demonstrate the biblical principles of unity and community and togetherness? So they see the man sitting there, Superintendent Edie, and the text says they take him by the right hand, the hand of covenant, and they give him three things. They give him, number one, affirmation. They helped him to understand that his existence did matter. Seminarians and psychologists understand this as the Rogerian uh, 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 notion of positive self-regard. Uh, in other words, the old folk used to say they looked beyond his faults and they saw his need. They were able to look beyond his external and take him by the hand. And you must understand that when they touched him, according to the scripture, because he was unclean, they became unclean. But they were willing to get dirty so that he could become clean. And it concerns me today when those of us in the shepherding business love crowds, but we don't love people. We want to have sheep, but we don't want to smell like sheep. We got armor bearers and security and adjectives that keep us from touching and feeling and communicating with the people. But Jesus gave us the example of being thronged by the people, being close to the people, touching and communicating with the people. If Jesus had the security that some of us have, we never would have had the story of the woman with the issue of blood. We never would have had the story of Jairus coming to Jesus. He never would have gone to Zacchaeus' house. He never would have called his disciples. John would have never laid on his bosom. When you touch the people, when you are human enough and humble enough to touch the sheep, that's called affirmation. Sisters and brothers, folk may be impotent, but they're still important. Number one, affirmation. Number two, they said, in the name of Jesus. We've got to tell you how you're going to get up out of this condition. So number two, they gave him information. And how important it is for us to give a counterculture message in this day and time when there's a celebration of ignorance afoot. Today we have adults that are more childish than some children, even in the church. So we have ignorance afoot, like basketball wise. We got ignorance of foot like love and hip hop and even uh, the saints are getting caught up in the reality TV uh, 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 epidemic that's going on today. 
Oh, we'll miss Bible study, but we are not going to miss an episode of Real Housewives. I can't get no help in here today. It's important that we don't celebrate ignorance. It's important for us to realize that as ignorance is being spewed in the interest of intelligence, we've got to countermand it. It's a terrible day and time when our young people think uh, talking crazy is what's up and being smart uh, isn't what's up. Uh, Come on, somebody. We've got to countermand ignorance. We've got groups, political groups out there talking about they want to take their country back. And I say, well, tell that to the Cherokee. Or to the Navajo. We've got to give them information. When we look at the young persons on the curb, we must understand that before we can correct them, we've got to connect with them and give them something that they can hold on to. We've got to countermand the message of the gay lobby. We've got to countermand the message of the Muslim that teaches black men that Christianity is not for them because it's a white man's religion. <laughs> They've got to understand that when it comes to the Bible, the Egyptian conceptualized it, the Jew formalized it, the Roman legalized it, the German theologized it, the European popularized it, the American individualized it, the Greek philosophized it, but it was black folk that spiritualized it. Howard Thurman said, we were possessed with an invisible tool of spirit that allows us to take hold of the invisible and create the intangible because God was with us. I got to hear it to my clothes. We must give them information after we've given them affirmation. But the text ends by saying, and they lifted him up. The man got up walking and leaping and praising God. Uh, number three, my sisters and brothers, we've got to give them inspiration. Uh, the text says the man started walking, which means he was healed physiologically, but he got more than a change physiologically. He was leaping and praising God, which means he received a change psychologically because no longer did he care about what folk thought about him. Uh, and we've got to inspire folk to change uh, the way they think. Uh, sisters and brothers, we survived genocide, the systematic destruction of the body. We survived infanticide, the systematic destruction of the young, but we must also conquer menticide, the systematic destruction of the mind. We've got to get to the point where we stop believing the lies of the enemy and start believing that better is possible. Matter of fact, you ought to tell somebody better is possible. This man started leaping. In other words, he was saying, I really don't care what you think about it, but do understand that earlier this day, I was lame and couldn't walk. But I got a word from the Lord. He got up leaping, and you might not be a leaper. Maybe you can just wave your hand, but we've got to change the way we think and understand that God can still do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or think. Well, I got to get out the way here. Notice, if you will, that Peter and John, watch this. They said, look on us. They didn't say, look to us. So church, we must point folk in the right direction. We've got to point them to the Lord. The church is only worth looking at if our example teaches folk who to look to. Yeah, your building's nice, but don't look at the building. The pews are nice, but don't look at the pews. The choir sings well, but don't look at the choir because the building can't save you. The pews can't heal your body. The choir can't deliver you from your habits. But I know a man from Galilee. If you're in sin, he will set you free. Somebody said, where do I go? When there's no one else to turn to. 
Who do I talk to when there's no one who wants to listen? Who do I lean on when there's no foundation stable? Would you tell somebody, I go to the rock of my salvation. I go to the stone that the builders rejected when the earth all around me is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I'm going to my seat, Pastor Edie, but silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give unto you. What is it that you have, Brother Swan? I got Jesus, and that's enough. I can point you to the cross, for it was at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Brother Brian, I got to get out the way, but can I tell you a little story before I close? I'm going to tell it in E-flat. Can I tell my story? There was a little boy and a little girl who lived in a crowded neighborhood. And they would take the school bus to school every day. And their mother was afraid that they might get lost one day. So she wrote down their address and telephone number and put it in the little girl's book bag said if you ever get lost give this to some adult and one day the unthinkable happened they got put off the bus in the wrong neighborhood brother Stokes and when the little girl looked in the book bag the piece of paper was gone the little boy began to cry chairman uh, but the little girl grabbed him by the hand and began to walk with all deliberateness turning down corners and cutting through alleys uh, until she finally made it home uh, and when they told their mama what happened mama said well how is it that you made it home uh, little girl said we live next door to that big church uh, with that great big cross on the top uh, and I just followed the cross uh, until I made it home uh, if you're lost uh, keep your eyes uh, on the cross uh, if you don't know your way uh, keep your eyes uh, on the cross uh, say